Yes, uh, well, welcome. Uh, and as this is about feedback, we hopefully we'll get to a point where we get a bit of audience feedback from yourself, a bit of questions, and obviously we want this to be a conversation, uh, not just us talking at you in a very unfeedback-like way. So um, if I could flip to the screen here. Ah, excellent. So welcome all, and I'm delighted to be joined by Kate from Channel 4 and John from the Digital Cultures Research Center at the University of West of England. And what we're really going to be looking at today is this concept of feedback. So this here is three insulin molecules interacting, and it's part of a system we have within our body, uh, part of the homeostasis system, which constantly monitors and changes the chemistry of our bodies in response to the environment outside, in response to internal changes. So if it gets colder, our body changes as a response. So within biology, we see these mechanisms all over, from the small scale, uh, and as here you can see at the molecular and cellular level, right up into the ecological level, uh, where actual organisms interact in these complex ecosystems. And key to these is the feedback loop, the feed-forward loop, is the flow of information, is the flow of data, and in this case, the flow of chemicals. Now, all that seems very abstracted, but actually, I think there's a lot we can learn from that. And so, I, John, you've been looking at a number of these concepts and, and how we can shape them in a, in a media bracket, if you like. Yeah, OK. T uh, thanks, Tom. Um, so... Um, why is it that we find ourselves increasingly thinking about media as a biological system? Why do we find ourselves thinking about ecosystems, for instance, and media as ecosystems? What's going on and what does that mean for documentary makers? Well, my working assumption for this session is that media is becoming software, and uh, software in its sophistication, complexity and power behaves in ways that look very lifelike or lifelike, like life. When we have these when we have our media in the data world online, it's subject to all kinds of complicated software operations and behaviours uh, that because of their complexity, we start to think of them as having a lifelike being all of their own. And so we start to think of ourselves as working within a kind of an ecosystem or an ecology where we're not actually in control of the whole world that our media is operating within. So I'm going to talk about uh, two um, aspects of this ecosystem. Um, one is to do with collaboration and participation, and the other is to do with data. So one way in which we're beginning to see these homeostatic feedback loops operating within media production is through collaboration and participation. When you adopt the notion of co-creativity, you put your work up and you ask for other people to contribute work that either adds to, complements to, or creates the content in some sort of user-generated dynamic, you're actually releasing control of your authorship in some way. You're giving away a certain amount of control for collaboration. So the project becomes much more of an amorphous process, much more of a living thing. It's not a linear program that you deliver to the broadcast, they put it out, it goes from beginning to end and that's it. It becomes something that exists over a long period of time and all kinds of things go on within that space. And we start to think of it as much more of a, as a, of a living organism type of experience. And in that sense, uh, what we become as authors are much more like curators. Or as I would say, to extend the biological metaphor, it's like we're actually, we've got this garden with all this content in and we're the gardeners who are trying to prune, clip, trim, encourage some things, put some weed killer down in other places. We're actually having to run a whole process in order to control the garden and make it beautiful and make it an, an in, in, encouraging experience for our audiences. And I think the best example for me at the moment that's gone on in that regard is 18 Days in Egypt, which some of you will know. How many people here know 18 Days in Egypt? So a smattering, okay. So 18 Days in Egypt is a project run by a guy called Jigamito and a whole bunch of others across the world, which began as a way of making a film from social media about the revolution in Egypt last year. But actually, in fact, has become, interestingly, a software project called Groupstream. And what Groupstream enables people to do is to make journalistic interventions into timelines and stories. So the whole story of 18 Days in Egypt is being curated via this software system called Groupstream by the people who were there at the time. 
and they're actually making this whole uh, a massive amorphous archive, which isn't even a film, it's an archive actually, of, of what happened. So that's a good example of what I'm talking about with the dynamics of collaboration and feedback. The second thing, though, is data. Uh, the web produces data, produces data in a wild and crazy profusion. Every time we go online, we produce data about our behaviours. Um, big data is, is a ma massive theme of the web at the moment. Um, one of the things that's happening in that regard, I think, that's interesting is what happens with HTML5. If you put your content up in HTML5, you can use a platform like um, Popcorn. How many people here know Popcorn from Mozilla? Good. Same, same number of people that know Giga Meta's work, actually. Interesting. Same people. So what Popcorn allows you to do is to put your content up and, and, and pull in Twitter, Wikipedia, blog feeds, um, uh, Google information, um, uh, all kinds of different stuff that's already out there on the web so that your content becomes permanently recontextualized. So the content that you produce whether it's archive or original content, becomes something which actually has a, an ongoing life, which is dominated, the nature of that life is actually determined by the feedback loop of the ecosystem of the search tags that you put into your original content. So you put certain search terms in and you link them into certain APIs, they pull in certain kinds of content. You've created a system which has its own feedback and its own dynamic over which you have very little control, actually, once you've set it up. So I think those are two really big examples where you can start to see the dynamics of feedback starting to affect what it means to be a program maker. So, I mean, Kate, is Channel 4 a homeostatic broadcaster? I mean, uh, we've got a clip, actually, which if you'd like to introduce and, and talk a little bit about, that would be... Uh, and how, how are you reacting to this kind of approach? OK, so... Uh, I want to show a clip about a project we did recently. It's called Foxes Live. And we didn't hand over all of the editorial to the audience, but a massive part of the editorial was kind of handed over to the audience. And it was the backbone of the show. So if we just watch the clip, you'll get a sense of what we did. Foxes Live, Wild in the City, a groundbreaking multi-platform event. Tonight, we launch a nationwide campaign to investigate Britain's most controversial carnivore. Four live television broadcasts and an online campaign engage the public in an innovative natural history experiment. We'll be gathering data from across the country in the biggest ever Fox survey that's been attempted. We need your help, though. For the first time, a television campaign encouraged viewers to take part in a comprehensive scientific study of a wild urban animal. By going online, they could upload fox sightings and check out activity in their neighbourhood compared to other parts of the country. You can see there's the map of the UK. Let's have a look in Surrey. Isn't that the most brilliant sight? Thank you, Becky. Ellesmere Port. Is that not the cutest little cub? Those blue eyes will turn brown, though, as it gets older. 18,000 people filled in an online survey which revealed why foxes divide public opinion. I think they're cute, but they're also vermin. We have taken over the, the, the property, basically. It's, it's there. They were there first. And state-of-the-art live tracking maps charted the forays of wild foxes. We've got seven foxes in all, each of them wearing a GPS collar. People were able to track the foxes live, seeing how fast and how far they travelled each day, gradually building up a picture of each fox's daily routine. The opening show featured the live release of Chico, a rescued fox wearing a GPS collar. Let's set Chico free. Off you go. you go. I'm going to be tracking Chico live here. You can see where he's been today. That's where he is right now. You can do the same right now by logging on. This highly popular twin screening moment generated over a thousand hits per second. The largest channel4.com hit rate since the Big Brother evictions. Welcome back to Foxes Live, and they are very live at the moment at both our dens. There was 24 hour live streaming from two urban fox dens. Yep, we've got five cubs. Oh, one of the adults coming in with a bit of food. Featuring the life and death struggles of the vixens and their young cubs. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that we've ever seen this filmed. Oh no, what is that? She's got a dead cub. 
Online viewers watched the dance streams late into the night, commenting on the unfolding stories. One character, though, Tom, seems a bit of a loner. He's likely to be bottom of the pack. User-generated content was integral to the broadcast. Last night, we asked if anyone had seen a black fox or a hybrid smoky red. This is a black fox that's been seen in Surrey, and this one is from Romford in Essex, and it's a cross between a red fox and a black fox. That is a smoky red. You need to be frightened. Lively debate took place on set and online. This is what's going to happen. No, no, we're well, saying... Well, that's what I'm that's saying. What, that's what's happening there. What we're saying is if you feed foxes... And series highlights were made available on the website. The scale of the project generated a media buzz across radio, magazines and the press. And with over 36,000 sightings and surveys submitted online, the final show presented the findings. Entering houses was a really big shock for me. It's a lot more than I thought. So we started off with about 79% people liking foxes, and over the week, as the programme's gone on, it's that's gone up? up to 86%. So now, what everyone wants to know, how many urban foxes do you think there are? A population estimate from sightings of around about 40,000. Citizen Science had produced the most comprehensive study of the urban foxes in the UK ever undertaken. By seamlessly integrating content across multiple platforms, Foxes Live inspired mass participation and entertained the nation. nice the foxes got a round of applause <laughs> I think it's more the cute foxes than probably applauding the actual merits of the project but um, uh, so so foxes we, we've literally just kind of come off the back of it really it went out at the start of May and it was a crazy project for us really kind of kick bollock scramble excuse my language but it kind of windfall came in to channel four with the idea really I mean it was pretty much kind of 10 weeks before we were on air um, and it's just kind of weighing up, right, do we actually go for this this year uh, and kind of make it or, or not? Because really, we were totally driven by the timelines of foxes and fox cubs, and you've got to hit that optimum time of the year when the fox cubs are big enough to be coming out to play, and so there's kind of, we can get footage of them out of the den and in the den, and so we're on a very, very tight timeline. Not only that, but we're trying to do science and technology that had never been done before so this was the first time ever that we'd done that in the UK ever there'd been a kind of uh, massive survey of the nation about foxes to kind of build up a picture of foxes in the UK and the reason why we wanted to do it in the first place was because we actually don't know much about foxes even though everyone probably thinks oh I saw a fox last week or they're kind of in their consciousness really we actually don't know much about them kind of scientifically particularly when it comes to numbers and what they do and and, and how they live and their habits um, so we were trying to do lots of things, lots of bonkers things, like actually putting GPS tags on foxes, which has never been done before, and you could actually track the foxes real time, which, which was amazing, but with that comes lots of kind of challenges around, well, how do we protect these foxes, and, and writing kind of protocols around security of the foxes, and, and what do you do if, if, if the GPS dot stays still for two hours, what do we do, what do we do, and just having this whole procedure in place. And for Chico, for example... I mean, the question came up, the fact that we were releasing him live on the show, and then it was a kind of two-screen moment where you at home could track Chico and where he was going in Manchester on the night that Man City were playing Man U. So we kind of thought that also gave us a little bit of added security. Everyone was busy watching the football. Um, but we actually did. Kind of, it was a last-minute decision, but we actually um, hired a security guard in Manchester that <laughs> night just to kind of keep an eye on Chico, just to check that he was OK and no one was actually going to go out and cause him any harm. Um, but anyway, I do digress. Uh, and Foxes isn't strictly a doc, but really what are docs in this space of the audience engaging with kind of content and creating content as you go? So it wasn't, it wasn't strictly a documentary in documentary terms, um, but we're here today talking about it because it's kind of documenting a story as it unravels and people are contributing to this story collectively. Uh, so for us, the feedback loop was the backbone of the show. 
Uh, that's a risky business in itself because you kind of think, gosh, well, what if nobody tells us any information about foxes or what if nobody posts a sighting? So you've got to kind of manage that by, of course, actually producing four hours of television alongside kind of exposing yourself to the point whereby, well, actually, that's when we're going to talk about what the science that people have given us and the data. And we work closely with Brighton University, who were brilliant, because it is very, very difficult to work with the university and get them to work on these kind of tight timelines where you're saying, right, we're going to get data. Um, we need you to analyze it kind of overnight and then speak about it on television the next day. And that's pretty scary, really, for kind of academics, and understandably so, because you think, gosh, well, this needs to be verified and checked and everything else. But Brighton were brilliant, and they said, look, we, we will never have access like this to data from the general public about foxes, so yes, we're going to do it, and yes, we'll commit to working to your tight timelines. Um, so we had the sightings map, we had the fox survey, and we had, in the end, 20,000 postings on the sightings map, which we were absolutely thrilled with, because... Sometimes that was just text uploaded saying, I spotted a fox down my road last week. She's got cubs. Um, but then at the other end of the scale, you, we got really rich video content from people that were filming these fox cubs in their garden and uploading the video, which was fantastic. And then we included that in the show. And then, of course, you had photos along the way. But people were beginning to connect their stories and say in Walthamstow, somebody was posting saying, oh, I saw a, a fox with, kind of, you know, with, a, with a black tail. Um, on Tuesday night, and then somebody would post saying, yeah, I saw him too in my garden yesterday. And it was just really lovely to see these kind of stories emerging and, pe and communities emerging around these foxes that lived in areas. Um, so for us, I, I mean, what's really interesting about doing con programming and creating content in this space is how do you configure it? And this is kind of one of the biggest challenges for us because... You want this feedback, and you want to be able to turn around television quickly enough to get it out there. That's quite difficult. So you end up immediately getting into the live territory. So our Foxes program couldn't be pre-recorded because we couldn't be putting these kind of calls to actions out saying, please tell us about Foxes in your area. We, we want to analyse it. We're doing the biggest survey ever kind of scientific study of Foxes in the UK. So therefore, you are doing a live show because you need the feedback. You need to turn it around quickly. Um, and then, it's, and then it's how do you get all the data in? Because if we launch this just online, and then essentially we, we thought, all right, okay, we're going to launch this online, and then one month from then we're going to do a month where we kind of gather all the data, and then we'll analyse it and then put out a couple of live shows in one week. You're not utilising the biggest megaphone you've got, which is a TV show. And so with Foxes, we decided to do a launch show in kind of, we'll call it week one, and that gave us a week to kind of get everybody talking about the show, watching the show, filling in the survey, plotting their sightings. And then the following week, we did three episodes on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then every night in between, we did a little kind of two-minute update about what was happening kind of in the Fox's Den. Um, so it's interesting because it, that's great for us in online terms because it gets everybody interested and everybody getting engaged with the project. But in TV terms, you know, we got all the press and the marketing at kind of episode one. And then there was this kind of weak lag before the other three shows. Uh, there's a bit of a feeling that we kind of possibly shot our load a bit too soon. And so we had loads of people there in episode one. But then kind of the following week, just the same kind of buzz. It kind of just dropped off a little bit because it wasn't as noisy in the press. So that's the biggest challenge for us as broadcaster. How do you get people engaged with the project, but then essentially kind of get it on TV at the same time? Well, I was going to talk a little bit about actually that retention thing sort of segment nicely into what's happening in video games and how they're approaching the same thing. So uh, anyone recognise this? Uh, Diamond Dash, anyone play it? There's a couple of hands. If you want to send me some coins on it, uh, I'd gratefully receive them uh, to up my score. So this is a fairly simple puzzle game where you have to just uh, click on three identical colours and then they vanish and more blocks come in. And what's so fascinating about this is the company behind this, this Wooga, this is, as John talked about, this is a live, ongoing thing. And the retention to them is really, really crucial. So every day they will be looking at around about 128 points of data and they will be updating the game on a weekly basis. And they use this method here called a, an A-B test. Um, this is an example of one using stuff on a website. So use it all the time. So what happens is if you've got a million daily players, you might take 50,000 of them uh, and they will play one slightly amended version. Another 50,000 will play another amended version 
and then you see which of those two slightly amended version gets the better results, and then you go with that. It's an incredibly powerful tool to measure retention, to measure user action. And interestingly, as, as we're a Wellcome Trust uh, sponsored panel, uh, one of the earliest A-B tests in recorded history was in 1747 when on board the HMS Salisbury, the ship surgeon divided a group of 12 sailors into two groups uh, and gave them slightly different diets to look the impact on the scurvy. Um, so it has this long sort of, sort of scientific tradition. There you go, I segmented that in. I, I should have had a bet whether or not I could have got that in. Um, <laughs> But in, so this is one of Wuga's games, this is Monster World, and this shows how two different approaches to the tutorial, and tutorials in video games is one of our key areas. We have a lot of complex stuff we've got to show the player, and we need to get them rapidly to understand how to play our game. If players aren't engaged quickly, they fall off and you, you lose their attention. In this case, the one on the left is a tutorial where the player um, had no choice but to follow it. They were essentially handheld all the way through, this is how you do it. The one on the right was a much more open version where, well, we'll just leave it running in the background, the instructions, but it's up to you if you do it. And interestingly, the one on the left had a far higher uptake rate and so resulted in far more people completing the tutorial and following through the game. But this weekly basis, uh, I mean, how would that have... If, if you'd have had been able to run Foxes again and you'd been able to change the time scales of the, the feedback loop, how might have, in terms of the retention, do you think that might have changed it? Um, so kind of tweaking as we go along and uh, hmm. adjusting. It's just, it's, it's, I suppose it's really, it's really tricky to kind of do that on those kind of timelines or respond to feedback and tweak your content accordingly. Do it on a kind of small scale. Um, and then, for example, even with the site, when the first kind of wave of people were using it, we were launched a kind of week before the first TX. There are a couple of things that obviously come to the surface and there are problems and little things that need tweaking so that happens but I suppose really in order to kind of do that you kind of need a bit of a bit of a long runner mm. uh, like I don't know I'm thinking EastEnders or something but like I mean for us at the channel the kind of the program that did go more through that process was was seven days really that was kind of more homeostatic yes. show <laughs> where we did basically mold the show each week depending on the audience feedback so we, when we were talking about this, this earlier, I think, John, you mentioned one of the key aspects of this is the, the sheer pace it's happening now. Because there's, there's nothing new under the sun in getting feedback on a programme. Uh, you know, you well, yeah, about feedback, on, feedback on programmes are usually just called ratings. Aren't they? I mean, that's, that's, that, that's the feedback loop that, we, that you all work with if you're in the business. But as you move more to an online dom domain or to television that's coming through broadband or to television that that can actually be where audience interaction with it can be, where you can see how long a mouse hovers over a frame or what the click-through rate is, or you could do the sorts of things that actually the Sexperience 1000 were talking about earlier on this morning, where they can actually look at their metrics of use on their site in a much more fine-grained way than ratings have ever allowed people to understand their audience behaviours. Then if you're in that world, you have more information and the question then is how you design the show so it can be, or the work, so it can be changed, so it's not running on rails, so there's enough space for you to actually be able to be, respond to audiences in a way that doesn't compromise quality, because that's the other issue here, is that if you just simply start producing work that responds to people's click rates, you might well finish up work that you don't even want to make in the first place, or is boring to you, or is in, isn't interesting, or, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily true that the audience are the best arbiters of the taste and the, and the, and the work that you want to do. But it, I was talking to uh, Ben from YouTube, I don't know if he's here, who did the opening uh, uh, keynote, one of the speeches at the start, and he was saying, you know, that the sheer data metrics you can get from YouTube around the, how far people watch through the film, uh, what point they drop off. Actually, I think there is plenty of scope to use YouTube to do A-B testing on films where you have two versions of the film and you then see which one has the performs better. Then you edit that one again and then you do it again and again. And it's that experimental method of the looping through, which in a way we can get away with it in games, I think, because to play Diamond Dash again and again and again is fun, but to watch the same documentary again and again and again isn't necessarily. No, and it's, uh, th that isn't going to work in terms of as well, because you can't, just as in the fact that 
your audience, well, they've watched it. It's like, imagine even a big series like kind of Mad Men. Imagine if they did a kind of pilot run on YouTube where they wanted to see where was the drop-off rate in each episode. But they wanted kind of critical mass by which to get decent enough data by which they could then use that to edit their program. And too many people would have watched it before kind of its premiere and it would have kind of, I don't know, just taken the kind of bang out of it a little bit. So I suppose, it, it, mm. well, arguably, possibly could. Possibly. Possibly. Um, but with something like, I mean, dial testing in TV, mm. that's essentially, I mean, what we're doing there is we're getting a kind of audience together and they've got a dial and they're peaking and peaking at the points that they like and turning down when they're not. And then that show will sometimes go back into the edit to kind of address certain things that that kind of raised. So how many times would you dial test a programme? Would it just be done once or...? It will usually just be done once. And it also, it won't be done against every show at all. It's kind of right. something that is used sometimes. Because it would be fascinating to do it 10, 20 times. Yeah, yeah. To, to constantly refine that and evolve... The that. dynamic yeah, of television yeah. is hit or miss. The dynamic of software is iterate, iterate, iterate. And they're different dynamics. Mm. And, and what we're seeing is a convergence of those two different kinds of worlds as the software world becomes more deeply integrated in the television world. Excuse me, open it out. Yeah, so we'll open it out now for a thing called feedback. Uh, so if anybody wanted to comment or ask a question, um, and I'll send you some diamond dash points in return. Uh, yes, gentlemen, over Well, that's a very, very interesting... And in, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. The, qu the, question is, the question is, are we really talking about um, evolution and um, is media actually evolving, not just in a metaphorical sense, but actually, is media ev are we actually seeing media subject to the laws of evolution uh, in their Darwinian sense? Um, and, and um, well, I, I have to hand over to Thomas since this is the subject of Thomas's PhD. But I hope, I, but I, but I hope, I hope it won't take him that long to answer the question. Uh, yeah, without. Uh, in short, I think absolutely it is. Uh, and in fact, if you if you want to think of it in evolutionary terms, the individuals in this case are the TV programmes, and the landscape they're released upon to survive or die is the audience. Is, is people. And because the audience by its nature is such an incredibly complicated field, what you'll find is a mixture of um, niches, you'll find things that survive really well and things that don't. And actually the key becomes, in, in, in biological evolution, the key becomes the speed at which you can adapt, which is why the most successful organism is viruses uh, by a long, long way, uh, because of the speed they can adapt and bacteria. Larger, more ponderous organisms consequently struggle, and that, that's where the, like, the feedback like loop TV comes shows. in. Like TV shows. I wasn't going to say that, um, but well, I, I think it's I think it's a it, it's a problem if, if you put huge amounts of resource to release something into the the ecosystem and you have no idea whether or not it's adapted to that ecosystem. Yeah, but if you look at it, I I, I totally get you, and and I also agree with. John about his point about TV, it's hit or miss, and then online we can iterate, 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 which we kind of do on the TV side of the online. Um, but on a grander scale, really, TV start to finish is being one iterative process, you know? So even when we're working, we're like, oh, there was that great bit in, in, in that, in 97, in that show that uh, Jamie Oliver made when, you know, and, and so you're kind of piecing together all these bits, and, and it is one big iterative process. But the little kind of little explosions of when you do do a release and it's, you know, a TV show, those, yeah, you struggle to reclaim those and recut and then put out again. Yeah, it's that ability to internalise into the, the substrate of the media itself, that learning, which DNA does brilliantly. And us humans, we have very selective memory. So I think that's where, if you like, the, the sciencey bit uh, can kind of 
slot in. But can it apply to, because you think, how about, I don't know, Charles Dickens, Great Expectations, how about if he put out his first edition and then, and then got feedback and then, and then went back to the drawing board and was like, oh, actually, I'm going to tweak that paragraph, tweak that paragraph, tweak that paragraph and put it out again. Does it work in other content uh, forms? Yeah, absolutely. And, and interestingly, because people like... Uh, um, in that period, they were publishing magazine in periodicals a lot. They were getting uh, monthly, weekly, depending on when their stories were published, because they'd serialised the story. They were getting feedback on a really regular basis. And I, and I think, actually, they, they responded to those. And, and so, yes, yeah, so, thank you. So would have produced multiple editions of the same thing. The, the, the point here that I just want to uh, make is that is that is that is, is about t is about timescales again. Okay, so you have you have the novel, you have cinema, you have television, and there and they're, they're, there is iteration built into their production in all kinds of ways. We know that, but when it comes to actually software and more media becomes software, the faster that process goes. That means that we all become nearer to the state of the virus or the fruit fly, the fruit fly in the lab, which reproduces very quickly. So change can happen much faster. So you can see the processes of evolution occurring much quicker. So the more you, you're operating in a world that's run by software, dominated by software, the more you see the processes of evolution happening at a faster rate. And, and I think it's important to distinguish between cinema, the novel, television, and software, because I think there is actually a difference, even though we're moving in that direction. That's a great point to end on. So uh, I want to thank um, John, I want to thank Kate uh, for being on the panel, and thank the Wellcome Trust for supporting this, and thank you all for listening. Thank you.